Uh, the next speaker is Professor Mirna Wurders from Vanderbilt University. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here presenting your paper for us. Okay. So as I said before, I don't think the people out there can hear me, but I'm ready. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm talking about the simultaneous emergence of money in the state. Uh, this is a new subject for me. It's, it's with a, uh, a new co-author of mine also, Gail Giraud from the University of Paris One. And uh, besides being a very talented uh, economic theorist, mathematical economist, uh, piano player, uh, he, uh, he also is a Jesuit priest. Okay, so he's rather busy right now. He's on a retreat. So if there's any questions with the paper that I can't answer, we'll have to wait till he's finished with his retreat. Okay, so um, this is, of course, in honor of Marilda Sotomayor. And most papers have key words. Here are my key words. Game theorist, mathematician, economist, entrepreneur, organizer, friend, characterized by charm, hospitality, graciousness, and she's a leader and she's a hero. Um, that's, uh, uh, yes, there you are, Marilda. There is my hero. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> What is she saying? She told you about, you told her about. Oh, I told her in St. Paulo, yes, but I didn't have the keywords in St. Paulo. I didn't have the keywords, right. I had the hero, but not the keywords, okay. Okay, so this is about what constitutes money. Actually, it's, it's a game theory applied to economic history of money, okay. And uh, there are multiple views of what constitutes money, demand deposits, units of account, fiat money, or the money used by the state. We're going to focus on money used by the state, money used by the straight state which may or may not have a value as, as a commodity. Uh, it can, yes, it could be anything that serves the needs of the state. Uh, our argument is that for fiat money, the state and, and the provision of public goods by the state occurred, sim occur simultaneously. Of course, this is a rough version. We know that there's, there's all sorts of intricacies involved, but what we do in theory, in economic theory, is we create models where we try to capture some essence of the world, right? Some essence of what goes on. In Marilda, in her matching model, she didn't really make a model of, of, of his lady and, and Ben, but she matched, right? And her matching kind of models characterize these kinds of matches. So we're creating a model here that's, that's a very stylized, a toy, a toy world, right? So the straight, our view is that the state created some form of money to pay the soldiers, and the citizens were required to take the money as payment for debts and to pay taxes in these money. They had to, they would, the soldiers could give them the money. They had to then take money because they had to pay taxes. Okay, in reality, they probably had to take the money and they had to take the money. After all, these were soldiers who were coming and saying, take my money for a chicken, okay, or whatever. Uh, the ruler used the taxes collected to pay the soldiers and thus provide the public good a security to its citizens and the rule along, yes, to its citizens. And the elites, the rulers, did not keep too much money for themselves because if they kept too much money for themselves, they would eventually be overturned, okay? And they wouldn't be able to provide the public good. And if you think of the public good as security, they wouldn't be able to provide, to provide security and they would lose power. Okay, now thus money circulated and was accepted as a medium of exchange. So there are papers that talk about money and taxes, right, and the creation of money and taxes, but we add a public good and a political economy model. So we formulate the economy as an infinite horizon, political market game, and demonstrate the emergence of the money of the medium of exchange. I want to recommend to you two books. These are great books. Okay, they're also not a difficult read. 
Uh, David Graeber, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. Uh, this book was recommended to me by Jean-Charles Rocher, a very famous economist, former president of Econometric Society. So any of his recommendations are worth taking. Uh, it tells many stories of the emergence of money, and, and uh, uh, he... He makes fun of barter, right? Money didn't arise because of barter. I mean, talks about the various social customs and ways that groups would interact within the group and, and uh, between groups to, to uh, trade, right? And there's a lot of sex in the book, okay? I think you have to be at least 18 uh, because... <laughs> <to> read, <laughs> Because it turns out that to establish friendly relationships and, and engage in trade with other tribes, you see, uh, typically they would kind of exchange favors, and the favors often involved women, kind of sort of temporary uh, exchanges, okay, on both sides. Everybody was very happy, and then the next day they would trade, okay. Uh, <laughs> The other book that's very good is Douglas North. Whoops, I thought I got rid of that double S. With Wallace and Wine, Winegast, The Violence and Orders, The Social Orders. There's also an English version. Okay, actually, the English version was the original, but we get, in, get to, uh, you know, too often we don't recognize uh, the originals when the originals are not English. Okay. And, and this also is a great book. Right? It's a really great book. I'm sorry that when I was a young economist, I didn't read more about economic history. And the main references for strategic market games, because we use a strategic market game, are these papers by Amir Sahi, Shubek, and Yao, and then several papers by uh, Dubey Ginekopoulos, Dubey Kaneko, and Shapley Shubek, who did the original market game work. Uh, but if we want to talk about a state and the emergence of money, we have to talk about what a state is. So a state is a collection of individuals typically living together in a connected area and united by common norms or a common currency and or some common laws, right? Law, and for a state, typically, I mean, you, you need or at least maybe a large population and the, a large state occur simultaneously uh, and the relationships between citizens may only be in their common citizenship. So they, it's not like a tribe, right? A state is not like a tribe or an extended family or a group of people who kind of all know each other or they're connected to each other. Uh, they may just meet in, to engage in one-shot games or few-shot games, right? And and this is where really this, the reach of the state or... The, the, uh, the unit of exchange must extend to anonymous relationships, right? You can't rely on reputation. Okay. You, uh, you know, much, of, much of the stories in Graeber's book also involve favor exchanges, right? I, I give you a goat today, and then when your son is getting married, and then a couple of years later when my daughter is getting married, you give me a pig, right? But you see, if people only meet once or twice, you can't go around giving them your commodities in the hope that sometime they'll be around if you need some more of what they have. So, uh, the, and the state needs a way to compensate, its, uh, of course, its uh, uh, people for its... Um, subjects for their contributions to the necessary public goods input. They need to give people something so that they will feed the soldiers. Okay. And money is, in some sense, then a compensation under the form of a liability of the state. Uh, and the state then levies taxes, taxes paid in money, money, they use the money to provide the public good. So here's this the quotation from, from Graeber's book. Why did subjects pay taxes at all? Well, of course they paid taxes. The answer seems self-evident. Governments demand taxes because they wish to get their hands on your money. Okay, this is clear. Okay, but if they become money, th but uh, then why wouldn't, uh, just skipping a little, why wouldn't the governments just grab the control of the money, the gold and the silver mines? Then the king or the ruler or the elites would have all the money they need. 
So what is, exactly was the point of extracting the gold, stamping one's picture on it, causing it to ter circulate among one's subjects, and then demanding the subjects give it back again, right? Because that's what happens. You give them the money, and then you have to get it back. Okay. Um, so uh, we take a hypothetical example. The king wishes to support a standing army of 50,000 men. Under ancient or medieval conditions, feeding such a force was an enormous problem. Okay, and then I, then I left out some. On the other hand, if one simply hands out one's coins to the soldiers and then demands that every family in the kingdom, kingdom was obliged to pay one of these coins back to you, you would, in one blow, turn one entire national economy into a vast machine for the provisioning of soldiers. Since now every family, in order to get their hands on the coins, must find some way to contribute to the general effort to provide soldiers with things they want. So, um, so really, money was um, created or brought into creation to help the king maintain an army so he could provide the public goods, which was, uh, which was uh, basically in the beginning of security, as far as we can tell. Um, there were other monies created. Okay, the Bank of Montreal in Canada had coins, uh, really, and, and means of... of, uh, of sort of means of, of creating money, but the Bank of Montreal didn't provide a public good. The goldsmiths had, uh, d in some sense, originated demand deposits, but they didn't provide a public good. They may have had their own private security, but no public good provided. Okay. So we want to provide, and this is what theorists do, okay, to provide conditions under which money emerges as a universal of exchange, universal medium of exchange, and as a means of payment of taxes. Money as simultaneously, right, these and, and uh, means to pay tra transactions to pay taxes and provision of public goods cannot be disentangled. So uh, this is an overview. I go through really the the same things I've been saying. Uh, oh, one thing I want to emphasize, in our model, we assume that, that people need the public good and they need it in a sufficiently high level. Okay, so, I mean, if somebody else has a gun and, and that's their kind of security and you have a stick, you're in trouble. Okay, you know, you have to have, you have, to have enough public good to make a difference. Uh, then, though, the problem is, why doesn't, of course, the politician or the ruler or the king take the money and run? Uh, and, and it's because if he does, then he will be replaced, and he himself will be subject to a fear of ruin, right? A fear that he himself will lose, his, uh, will lose the benefits of the, of the public good and be afraid, likely to suffer ruin. So we look at a, a, a model, and along the Im equilibrium path, the politician in power does purchase public goods and uh, pays taxes, okay? And, uh, and people pay taxes. They pay taxes in our model voluntarily. They pay taxes voluntarily, okay? And we conclude that the uh, emergence of the state money and state-provided public goods occur at the same time. Now, I want to just go back a minute to why they pay taxes voluntarily. Of course, each of us would be happy if we paid less taxes, right? We don't want to pay as much taxes as we do. But uh, perhaps many of us, if when we pay more taxes, everybody else pays more taxes, would be happy with the taxes we're paying, right? If we, because if everybody paid less taxes, we, I would be less well off, okay? Um, and if everybody sort of deviated from paying taxes, we would be in a bad situation, uh, as some countries have been when they don't, you know, when there's a big underground economy and they don't collect taxes. Greece is an example, I believe, of this. Okay. Uh, as I've said, the politician cannot either use the uh, commodities or she can either spend the money for herself or not, but so she will want to use it to uh, buy public goods. So we look at, we start by looking at a one-shot game, okay? 
players act strategically and prices form following a market game mechanism, and that is players take their commodities to trading posts. Prices for each commodity are determined by demand and supply. More formally, H households, and there's a trading post for every pair of commodities, so you can take, have, take apples and oranges to a, a trading post, right? And how many apples and how many oranges are at the trading post depend, uh, yes, are determined by the players, the, the citizens, and the price is determined by their relative abundance. If few apples are taken to the apple and orange trading post and many oranges are taken, then apples are going to be expensive in terms of oranges. Okay. Uh, the strategies of the players are the amount of each commodity to take to the trading post. And as I said, prices are determined by supply and demand. The nth commodity is called bead and, and, may, and may have an intrinsic value for consumption or may not. Bead could be either salt or beads or gold jewelry uh, or seashells or whatever. And beads are then a store of value in a, or could be a store of value in a universal medium of exchange. Um, we assume that, uh, did I miss a slide? No. There's transaction costs uh, and we also assume that the transaction costs are less than the tra in beads at the bead trading post, right? Are less than it's cheaper to take your your apples to the bead trading post, get beads, and then buy oranges than it is to go uh, directly to the apple orange trading post. Okay. So it's just the cheapest the cheapest uh, place to trade. Players have strategies. Of course, this, as I said, taking what they take to each trading post, and we have a Nash equilibrium. So here, one of the traders gains the ability to produce the public good. So one of the traders becomes a politician. It, we take it as happening randomly. Of course, in the real world, it doesn't happen randomly. But uh, for our purpose of, of our model, it's a random, something that happens randomly. Uh, we have a production function, and the utility of a player is given by the utility that he gets from his private goods plus the utility of the public good. Okay. And player, the, the start player can buy inputs for the production of the public good, and she can raise taxes. So she sells tax receipts. She introduces a new commodity called taxes, and she sells receipts for taxes. So you take, you pay your taxes and you get your tax receipt. And that's the commodity that's being sold. Uh, no, no commodity can be traded against the uh, taxes. You have to pay for taxes using beads. Okay. So the beads now are the money and the taxes are the, t uh, come or appear in the form of tax receipts. The trading, the trading post of beads for tax receipts has a zero transaction cost, and the tax receipts do not enter the utility functions of anyone. So a strategy profile for uh, most players is for every period now to take their commodities to uh, their each commodity trading post and uh, Another, another trading post, a supply of beads against tax receipts. So how many beads you take and how many tax receipts you get back. And so each player then has uh, this new strategy of how much to pay in taxes. This player, the politician is special because she gets the tax receipts. She uses a part of them for her own consumption, and she takes the rest and uses them to... Uh, produce the public good. Okay. So we put this in an infinite horizon economy in discrete time with finitely many types of, of long-lived households, each of them represented by a continuum. Um, and the N plus one commodities in the public good are perishable. We could allow durable money. That would be no problem. And then we have a formal structure, which I won't bother much about. Uh, the state of nature is t chosen by a Markov transition matrix with a finite set of possible states of nature. And a history is a realization of those states of nature. Now, the, the randomness comes in in that, uh, in that um, 
the endowments are uncertain, right? You don't know what your endowment will be, for sure, in each period. Okay. So you get a possible different endowment at each period. That's kind of funny notation there. It looks like a, looks like a, uh, a typo, the exclamation mark. Ah, oh, yes, that should be a one. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and, and households are never endowed with tax receipts, right? You don't get, you know, you can't inherit any tax receipts or they, they won't be randomly given out to you or we should hope not, right? I suppose that would be corruption. Um, you're expect, you're, they have an expected utility. They maximize their expected utility. And uh, uh, with respect to commodities and with respect to the public good. So... This is an important assumption. Don't bother to read it, okay? What this assumption means is that uh, if, if you have no public good, if you have no public good and, and your endowment or the amount of, of goods that you're allocated gets near to the boundary of the consumption set, your utility becomes arbitrarily low, right? So if you don't have a public good, you have a fear of ruin. You could suffer ruin, right? This would be like all you have left is a stick and somebody comes after you with a gun, okay? Uh, and and uh, each household, so this is the fear of ruin, ruin. Each household evaluates her expected discounted utility with respect to her own subjective probability measure. Uh, and, you know, they have their own beliefs about how likely they are to suffer ruin or what their endowment might be in the future. Um, okay, so this really describes, describes the, uh, the game that's going on. I know it's a little loose, but I hope you got the idea. Any kind of clarifying questions? Okay. Okay. So each citizen can potentially become a politician. I alluded to this before. And this is what politicians do. They raise money and taxes and decide on what we get for our taxes. We start the economy with a politician in power. Uh, citizens trade according to the strategic market game each period. And the politician in power chooses what to produce. Or elections are held. Citizens jointly decide whether to keep the re politician or replace her with a new one. If a portion of citizens prefer to replace the politician, then the politician becomes out of this, out of office, and in this case, another another citizen is chosen at random. Okay. Ah, I was looking for the button on the mic to forward this, but it's, no, it's not on the mic. Okay, <clears throat> so we look for uh, really a subgame perfect equilibrium. Okay, that's renegotiation, renegotiation proof. So uh, the um, I won't I won't go into the details of these either. So subgame perfection I think is a refinement that most of you know about. It's really um, foresighted in some sense, or looking back to see uh, what would be the best decision. And it's renegotiation proof if there does not exist another subgame perfect equilibrium that makes all players weakly better off. Okay. Um, each household has their own estimate of the transition matrix, and we assume that each citizen's estimates are not too far from the truth. But we also assume that there, there's some dispersion of these estimates. I think that's quite reasonable, right? That there's some dispersion of the estimates of the transition matrix between, between different time periods. Okay. Uh, they say that you cannot get two economists to agree. Well, you certainly can't get everybody in a whole state to agree. Okay. Um, so, yes. Then, then that's the second. That was the second. This is the third main assumption. Uh, right. No, no individual can produce enough public good in some state. Right. So for all households, eventually they're in a position where they themselves cannot produce another pub enough public good. No individual can produce a level of public good than the required threshold in every state, right? 
So, so the public good is useless unless you can produce enough. And sooner or later, even if you're wealthy now, you're not going to be able to protect yourself in all states in the future. So here's our, assumption, our main theorem. Okay, and, and uh, recall the assumptions. No individual can produce a level of public good higher than the th threshold G in every state. Okay, so you may be rich this period, you may be a Vanderbilt or a Rockefeller, but then, but then uh, your grandchildren may spend much of the money, as apparently in the Vanderbilt family they did, and uh, then you can't buy all the security and protection for yourself. Uh, individual beliefs are not too far from the truth. That was the second main assumption. And if the public good is less than this critical level, then individuals have fear of ruin. Now, I think this fear of ruin is a reasonable assumption, okay? Uh, without a state, without the protection of a state or the unifi unification of a state, the group of us together, a coalition, we are sub we're, we're vulnerable, okay? Then our theorem says, along any equilibrium path induced by a non-autarkic renegotiation proof subgame perfect equilibrium, there exists a time such that there is no replacement of the politician after that time, and the politician makes sure that enough public good is produced. Now, you think about this, okay? So, so this doesn't mean that... that the Republican Party, for example, in the U.S. stays in power, the Democrats stay in power and forever, but we basically have one political system, right? Uh, and it's a system with elections and so on, but, and, and the, the politicians uh, may exchange favors, they may do very well, but, but no politician, I think, in the United States who's ever elected is really going to reduce the country to ruin, okay? Um, they themselves like, a, a, and the elites who support them want a prosperous state with public good provision. Interpretation, every, suppose that every politician on power simply consumes all our purchases. Then from the above, each such politician will eventually lose power. After having been removed, a politician became, becomes again an anonymous household with nearly incorrect, with somewhat incorrect beliefs. Eventually, uh, she would make an end up, end up with mistakes and end up with a bu consumption bundle arbitrarily close to zero and within a situation where she may suffer ruin. Uh, and the current... Um, yes. But, and, and if she loses power, then another politician may also come into power and not, or if she doesn't produce another public, enough public good, another po politician can come into a power who may also not produce enough public good, and so there is still a fear of ruin. Thus, our former politician should have accepted to produce the public good when she was in power in order to, keep re to be reelected and make sure she has public good uh, in the future. Taxes are paid, and a quantity of the f sufficient quantity of the public good is produced. If people didn't pay taxes, right, you'd have you'd have uh, no public good, fear of ruin, right? But as I say, the voluntarily is not that some that that we wouldn't all like to pay less taxes. Okay, you know the the IRS doesn't come to me and say how many taxes, should, much taxes would you like to pay this year? They say how much? Well, you uh, or here's the form, fill it out. This is what taxes you must pay, right? But as I say, I'm happy with that. In fact, if everybody would pay more taxes, if if everybody else paid more taxes, I would happily myself personally pay more taxes, right? I think security and public goods and are really good things in life. Right. So here is our conclusion. Citizens are willing to pay taxes and accept money as a universal medium of exchange because they need a public good. A household accepts to play the role of the somewhat, not necessarily completely benevolent government because it's safer to do so rather than incurring the risk that no public good is produced at all. And, you know, politicians will always argue that they are the best best people, right? The current politicians will argue that they're the best people to make sure that we have a well-functioning economy, which to some extent, well, means well-functioning government and, and uh, well yes, well-functioning government in, and in the well-functioning economy. Um, 
And that is my last slide. And I finished in time, yes? <laughs> okay. Indeed, uh, in advance. Thank you. We have time for questions. Is there any question? In this model, is there a limit to how much people are, are willing to pay on taxes? The question is, is there a limit to how much people want to pay in taxes? Yes, right? There is. Okay. I mean, the limit is determined endogenously by their preferences. Okay. So if, if they, they get enough public good, but it doesn't say, our model doesn't say how much, right? They could exceed, if they really like the public good, they could exceed the lower bound. Okay. But uh, um, the utility function one can assume is concave, right? And that they will want some, but, uh, but, uh, but you know, unless, unless the society is very wealthy, it'd be some bounded amount. Yes, David. Sorry, yes. I think you assume that there is a share of the population that if they agree on, then they, they can overthrow the the politician. Yes. Is there some way of uh, to endogenize this uh, share? Is this something exogenous? This can, I mean. Um, can we endogenize or put more more detail really into the political story? Right. That's basically the question. Uh, how much of the population you need to overthrow or overturn the government, or for the government to fail? Uh, that would be possible, but. Uh, the model is already pretty complicated, right? With the, both the political game and the strategic market game in each period. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to be able to do that. Uh, there was, and I'm I, it escapes my mind, there was a debate by Asimoglu and Robinson about, about uh, whether coalitions or groups were important also, which uh, may relate to that. Okay. Somebody back there to question. Okay. Actually, just a couple of cl clarification questions about the model. Uh, two things. First, the fear of ru ruin in the, for the purpose of this model, is it a bi binary vi variable or a scalar variable? That, I mean, scalar, no. But it, I mean, it is right. So it, it's the fear of ruin. Uh, individuals consume bundles of commodities, but the fear of ruin is that their utility from the bundles may become arbitrarily low, may uh, you know get near to minus infinity if they have only private goods and the private goods become small, right? No, no I mean, in the sense of is how much fear of ruin. The person have depends on how much public good th they get, or is it an on and or off state? Ah, okay, it's on or off. It's on or off because if you don't have, you have to have at least enough public good. You know, mm -hmm. one soldier with one gun—that's a minimum. Okay, or maybe fifty thousand with with uh, uh, rockets or something, uh, missiles. Okay, but you have to have that minimum. Uh, really to to benefit from the public good, to protect you from the fear of ruin, right? Now, actually, that's something else that could be perhaps more, end, more endogenous than it is, right? You know, the fear of ruin could depend, for example, on how much of the private goods you have, or at least on your X, your private good consumption. It could be a function of, you know, instead of just the constant level, you need at least G bar, to protect you from the fear of ruin, it could be some function, right? You know, you get more fearful as G goes down. But again, complicates the model, right? 
just I mean, basically uh, you want to make a model simple enough so that you can work with it and people can understand it right and complicated enough so that it reflects some reality and and people don't say well that's obvious right because you can't publish it then <laughs> Okay. That's the ruin of researchers. Uh, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a clarification. Usually, when you think about public goods, you think about the free riding problem. But here yes. it seems to, to be the reverse, in the sense that there is somebody, you know, paying uh, the duties to be a politician, take care of the the, the, the yeah. economy. Yeah. Well, the politician here does have control of all the tax revenue. Okay. And the politician can keep. Can, she chooses how much she wants to keep, right? And and she wants to keep. She doesn't. She wants to ensure that she's reelected, yeah. and so that she can continue to make the economy function, right? Um, you know, some some of course some politicians don't worry enough about about public goods and the fear of ruin. I mean, the Tea Party would just as soon we didn't pay any taxes, but I don't think they understand. That if you don't pay taxes, you're not going to get the public goods. Um, uh, my my wealthy students, well wealthy students at Vanderbilt, sometimes some of them think that that they don't want public goods very much, right? Mm -hmm. But they definitely want people to protect their property. Okay, you know, so it's a public good. Okay. Is there is there another question over there? Just just one more. So while the microphone I was going to get there is getting to you, I was going to say to some extent our work completes the model, right? Because people have looked at taxes before, but they haven't looked at public goods as as. And as the taxes is really based on the public goods and the necessity to pro provide public goods, yes. Oh, thank you. It's just a question of a clarification. Uh, you said uh, if you pay more taxes, uh, you have more public goods. Right. So I do not understand how it uh, deal, deal with uh, in, the, in your model if uh, you pay more taxes and you do not have public goods. Right. So how it... Uh, Right. So this you is have incorporated in your model. Right. So this is a possibility in our model, right? So the politician, for example, may provide this critical level, provide the critical level, but tax really heavily, so that her gain to taxation is very large, right? Uh, but here we come into the notion that if if a majority or if a sufficiently large fraction of the population is unsatisfied, right? The, and they want more public goods, they're paying more, and the government doesn't provide them, then they will eventually overturn the government, right? This is an argument that's, of course, been very popular uh, and much, much relied on in some of the political economy literature, that people do become unhappy. Now, um, right. And, of course, sometimes they have to become very unhappy, Right, willing to risk their lives, okay, to overturn governments that are corrupt, right? Thank you very much, Mirna. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.